Stocks are tanking. Bonds are tanking. Commodities are tanking. The dollar is spiking. What is going on? Markets are imploding. We have a liquidity crisis that is on its way, potentially to becoming a solvency crisis. Not potentially. I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. This is going to be worse than 2008 by a long shot, and that is due to massive policy errors over and over again by the Federal Reserve and, of course, a complicit silent press and Congress and Senate who failed to ask the appropriate question. So, hey, here we are, but it's a global thing. There's really nowhere to hide. So let's dive right in, take a look at this. Liquidity, this is an important concept. So this is what I do. I help to educate people about how things work. So best as I can, I'm going to explain to you what we mean by this. You probably heard the term liquidity. All right. Liquidity is something that's out there floating around. I'll define it in just a second. But what happens is you move from liquidity can be turned into an insolvency crisis. An insolvency is different from bankruptcy. So liquidity crisis precedes, uh, insolvency crisis precedes bankruptcy. So that's a three-stage process. Good to know where you are because it tells you a lot about what's about to happen next. 2008, we had a liquidity crisis that turned into a solvency crisis that ultimately became the bankruptcy of Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, and that, of course, precipitated the whole great financial crisis. Now, um, what does that really mean? So bankruptcy is a legal proceeding. That's what happens after the creditors and the lawyers and the judges and the court systems all pile in. Insolvency means that you no longer have the capability of servicing your debts, right? But you could be insolvent at home. You could be, lack the ability to pay off your credit card debt, but you're not bankrupt yet because, you know, the, the sheriff hasn't shown up to take your house and all your possessions and things like that. So liquidity, what's liquidity? Let's start here. So oftentimes people have this version of liquidity. This uh, market liquidity refers to the extent to which a market, such as a country's stock market or a city's real estate market, allows assets to be bought and sold at stable, transparent prices and rapidly. If you hold a single treasury bill with a face value of $1,000, you can sell it instantly. If you have a single share of Apple stock, you can sell it instantly. What if you had 100 million shares of Apple stock? Mm, that's harder, right? It's not quite as liquid. What if you had a trillion dollars of treasury bonds? Uh, that's harder because the market liquidity isn't there. The depth, the number of participants who are willing to bid and pay a certain price for something, that is market liquidity. But what I'm talking about here is systemic liquidity across the entire universe of all things financial. So if financial conditions are easy, meaning it's pretty easy to go out as a, as a junk, dated, junk debt rated company to go out and find somebody who's willing to lend you money at a, an acceptable price. If you can, you know, get 10 credit card offers in the mail, if you can easily find three or four mortgage companies that would be willing to offer you a mortgage, we are in easy financial conditions and you have a lot of what we'd call systemic liquidity, which is provided by the central banks. That's sort of the headwaters of the Nile. But we're in a moment where that systemic liquidity is now drying up. So let's go there and take a look at that systemic liquidity. Um, so market liquidity, though, it's really actually pretty complicated. So I said, oh, you know, if you could sell a share of Apple, it's quickly, that's liquidity. But actually, so market liquidity it's a function of you got your macroeconomic environment, what's happening all over the globe. You've got monetary policy. Uh, your technology can often help grease the axles of the whole liquidity train. You got regulation. You've got the risk appetite of investors and entities. You've got funding and market funding. You got search costs, investor base, day to day liquidity, and liquidity resilience, I like that word. But all of this collectively comes together in something we call liquidity. So, because liquidity is drying up, this is something you need to know about because this explains why markets are tanking right now. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, not just any markets, all of them, commodities, stocks, bonds, real estate, currencies. Okay, let's go there and look at what we mean by systemic liquidity. Well, systemic liquidity happens because the system freezes up. There just isn't as much trading action. There isn't as much currency floating around to facilitate all of these transactions. But fundamentally, the most important component to keep systemic liquidity easily moving along is trust. That's right. You live in a faith-based economic system. So when Lehman Brothers, all of a sudden, you know, everything's fine until all of a sudden people, other big banks mainly, got the vibe that maybe Lehman Brothers wasn't good for 
the counterparty trades they had with them and the trust evaporated and then the company evaporated. It's really important. Trust is really important. So these are some of the things we see in that systemic liquidity. So we start over on way over on that far side there and we see you, you start with some sort of a shock and the shock might create funding problems at bank A. And then if that leads to failure of bank A, whoop, we shoot up top to confidence effects. That trust, that begins to ripple throughout the entire system. Failure of bank A leads to counterparty credit risk. The person on the other side of the trade, hey, I loaned you a billion dollars. You're the counterparty. What's the risk? I'm not gonna get that back, right? That would be the counterparty credit risk. And then it leads to funding problems at other banks that woo, feeds down into additional asset sales because people are trying to raise cash so they can be more liquid. And that can lead and funnel back through the shock. These things become self-amplifying very, very quickly. And this is why central banks are always, if they ever have the chance in the business of providing more liquidity, not taking it away. We're in an environment now where it's being taken away, but also it's out of the central bank's hands. They have just a part of this story. They create just part of the overall liquidity structure. The rest of it, actually most of it, the bottom of the pyramid actually comes from the banking system and from the shadow banking system and from all the financial intermediaries. What do I mean? So, well, you know, like um, General Motors really isn't a car company anymore. It's a financing company with a car company bolted on the side. And so they have their own funding and liquidity needs, and they are part of this larger ecosystem that creates credit in order to facilitate certain things like you buying a car in this case, but it could be anything related to how countries interact with each other, what companies need, uh, what private individuals need. And it's a huge, giant, complicated thing. And it's only gotten more and more complicated in my thesis is that nobody really understands it anymore, which means that when the shock comes, when you get that 2008 moment, which is happening again, the central banks are about as clueless as anybody else. So they're just people after all. So um, this is what a systemic liquidity cycle might look like. First, you start at the top of the 12 o'clock position, you have stable market conditions. We've had those for a very long time. And that has leads to abundant liquidity. Lots of trust is a form of liquidity, lots of currency because the central banks are printing, lots of shares being offered, lots of deals being cut, IPOs, private equity deals at all. Yeah, you get a lot of that abundant liquidity. Everything's possible. And that leads to a liquidity illusion. People start to believe like, oh, this will always be there. I believe this happened in a lot of the, um, uh, the I have a term for this, I shouldn't say on, on YouTube, but the, there's Bitcoin and then there's the altcoins. That's the polite way to say it. So a lot of these altcoins, they were, they were built on this liquidity illusion. You know, you'd see these things come out of the gate and suddenly be worth tens of billions of dollars, even though they had no economic model. They had no, um, there was no cash flows. There was no business plan that was anywhere in the site. It was just people were buying them. So more people bought them, which created that illusion of, Hey, these things are worth a lot. So you're in the liquidity illusion right there. And everybody from the biggest players on down to the smallest believe this is how it will always be. It will always be abundant, ample credit. Now, if you're going to have a bubble, you need two things. You need a good story and you need ample credit. So when there was a tulip bulb, tulip bulb bubble back in the 1600s in Holland, it was a great story. Oh my gosh, people always want to have these. These things are worth a ton. And, you know, the, a single bulb of the Semper Augustus uh, tulip was worth as much as the finest house in the finest canal in Holland. Crazy, right? That was the story, but there was also ample credit. There were people were extending credit to each other and banks got involved and you needed that credit. Uh, the railroad bubble here in the United States back in the uh, early 1900s. Again, great story. You needed ample credit. The dot-com bubble that we had around 2000 in the United States. Great story. Pets.com is going to make amazing amounts of money. Here's why. And we had ample credit. So you need those two things. The central banks are in charge of making sure we have ample credit in the story. But you need the story. So people get carried away. You get the story. And that's part of that liquidity illusion. All right. And then you have system-wide liquidity leveraging down there at about the 5 o'clock position. Leveraging, fancy word for taking on debt. Uh, my company earns a million dollars, but my company gets to borrow because of that liquidity illusion and all the abundant liquidity. I might be able to borrow uh, 10 million against that. 
or I'm an investor, I'm able to borrow on margin, say three times what my portfolio is worth, or if I'm a you know, treasured private equity or hedge fund, maybe six times, maybe 10 times, or if I'm Goldman Sachs, maybe 40 times what's actually what I actually have. So that leads to system-wide liquidity leveraging. Why system-wide? Because everybody trusts the system, right? So with all that trust and all that liquidity, everybody's borrowing because you're a fool if you don't. You make a lot of money when you lever up. If I can invest $1 and earn 10%, I've earned a dime. If I can lever up tenfold, I take my original dollar, but now I have 10 earning 10%. Now I earn a dollar. So I just earned a hundred percent returns. Makes sense, right? Okay. Uh, the liquidity disillusion happens when like, uh Oh, people get the vibe tide goes out. Now the story's changing and that leads quickly to system wide liquidity deleveraging. That's where you are. That's where we are in this story. I'm going to show you the data that shows you where that's happening, at least in uh, most of the big corners of the market. That's where we are. And that leads very quickly up to that checker, you know, the, the dotted line box up there, which is around potentially fire sales, systemic shocks, crises, all of that. And eventually you get to recovery, presuming you haven't really gone too far and you've uh, done the equivalent of Rome leaving Northern Europe um, and um, back in the day and, and leading to something called the dark ages, which is 400 years of people trying to remember how to do great stonework and, um, you know, have clean water and stuff that the Romans took with them when they left. So that's where we're at here in this story right now. And so this is the landscape today here. We're looking at about three months worth of currencies. We have the U S dollar in the top against the Euro next, then the Canadian dollar, then the Swiss franc, then the Japanese yen, then the British pound, going to get more on that one in just a second, the Australian dollar, the New Zealand dollar. What's the theme? Every one of these is crashing against the dollar. And I mean, crashing in some cases down, you know, 10, 20, even 30%. That's extraordinary. It's very unusual. And why is this happening is the key question. And if you understand why this happening is happening, I think you got a good chance of understanding where the future is going. This is 2008 all over again. These sorts of things we're seeing here. This is a liquidity crisis. The signs I look for in a liquidity crisis are a spiking dollar, spiking yields, and falling assets, which would include, if you have all of them involved, real estate, bonds, stocks, and um, commodities. So we're seeing that right now. So this is really actually a fairly significant liquidity crisis, and the central banks are committed to letting it run. Why? Because politically, it's going to be almost impossible for them here, at least in the United States pre-election, to do anything other than carry on on this course because, in, guess what, inflation is wildly unpopular and it's raging out of control right now and it's really harming voting families. And I think that's the story. The, you know, the Federal Reserve, bless their hearts, I mean that in the Southern sense, they, um, uh, they went really all out on pretending as if inflation was not going to happen as a consequence of their actions. And they pretended like they didn't notice it for a long time because it was only happening in housing in stocks and bonds. It wasn't happening in the price of milk or gasoline. Once it bled over into the price of milk and gasoline, their hands got tied. There wasn't much they could do. And now they are committed to this tightening cycle. Can the tightening cycle be halted politically before it leads to a really major solvency and or bankruptcy crisis? I think the answer is no. And we're seeing that um, all over the landscape. So this is what we're seeing here. This is astonishing. Look at that dollar just spiking there. Now, this is a really big deal and it's a huge deal because what that means is it's not happening because everybody in the world woke up and said, I don't want Swiss francs. I don't want yen. I don't want dollars in any of these other countries or euros. I want, I want U.S. dollars because that's the best thing you can hold right now. Now, this is happening because certain types of speculative trades are being unwound. It's happening structurally. It's happening because there's a lot of bets that went out on when there was this liquidity illusion that made a lot of sense. And once they don't make any sense, you got to undo them. I'll be talking more about this in part two just to deepen uh, the understanding of my members around this is uh, this whole dynamic because you have to if you understand this if you understand how the game is played you have a much better chance of predicting where we are in the game and where it's headed and right now all the signs i have say this thing is heading deeper 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 into a liquidity crisis 
and it's going to lead eventually into something breaking. Lehman once upon a time, but who knows what it's going to be this time. Is it a country going belly up? Is it a whole tranche of debt going bad at the same time and taking out a bank that leads to other banks and leading to that cascading domino series of failing banks that ultimately leads to other crises? Don't know, but we're going to keep our eyes out for the clues. So one of those clues is here. Hey, sound is a pound, baby. Uh, this is not, that looks like a that looks like uh, one of those meme coins I was talking about before, but it's not. That is a reserve currency asset. That's the UK pound spiking down pretty much almost 5% at its worst part of the plummet in a single day. 5% for a major currency. This is a sign of something breaking. This is the sound of a rivet popping out of a ship's hull under pressure. This is a sign of extraordinary panic and stress. This is a sign of somebody getting carried out on a stretcher, hopefully a smallish fund, not a really, really big one, but this is extreme, full stop. That's amazing. That's just the British pound, but look at it all the way down there at 103. If you're like me, you're old enough to remember when the British pound was worth two to the dollar. Now it's getting close to one to the dollar. Uh, that's extraordinary. What else do we see? Well, we see treasuries tanking. This is the U.S. 10-year rate. So much is keyed off of this. Mortgages in the United States are keyed off of this rate, meaning as the yield here goes up, so does the cost of a mortgage or the mortgage interest rate, obviously. So bonds, uh, very simple to understand. They've got a rate of interest and they've got a price. As the price goes up, the rate of interest comes down and vice versa. And that's what we're seeing over here. The price, these things are being sold and sold hard, and that means the yield is going up. Not just a little bit. That's a pretty extreme move there over the last week for the U.S. 10-year Treasury. It's, it's pretty astonishing. Again, this is amazing. But looked at at a higher level, it's even more amazing. These are U.S. investment-grade corporate bonds. So these are B-grade and above investment-grade. These are the good ones. Uh, these are in good companies. Charlie Bilello put this together Look at the at the total return that you might have gotten starting in year 1973, way, way over there. For that year, investment grade corporate bonds returned 2%. Bad year in 1974 though, they tanked 4.7%. But then they yielded plus 15.7%, plus 18.8%. You read that down, let's just key in together on the red bars in there. You will see that 2022 year to date is the worst year for corporate bond returns in this entire series going back to 1973. That's like 50 years of data practically. One more year and we're at 50 years of data. That's astonishing, it's really amazing, and it's a very powerful signal. Why is this happening? Because there's a liquidity crisis, because people are, pi investors and people are piling out of those bonds because somebody needs the cash more than they need to hold the bonds. It's happening because there are more sellers than buyers. So tank they go. But this is investment grade bonds. How about the junk bonds? Um, doing not so good. Remember, prices and yields go opposite to each other. These are yield spiking. So that means prices are falling. Yields are going up. And uh, so junk bonds are, are going back. But look at the, look what we see here. This is, um, this is looking at a spread actually between corporate high yield and to the worst. So this is like you take high yield all the way down to triple C, which is like, they're, they're all like D is default. Triple C gets you one step below default. So at any rate or above, look at this. It used to be that you were getting just a 1% spread down there. Um, and now look at it. Uh, that That's a, just an astonishing level up there. It's, it's a really high number. So bottom line, junk debt going bad. Now junk debt, what's junk debt? Junk debt's like really badly rated companies. What's a junk debt? Um, that's like loaning money to the local uh, drug addict on uh, the corner of your street up, up there in town and thinking, you know, they might pay me back, right? That it's probably not a good loan to make. Uh, you just kiss that money goodbye, right? So, so junk debt are poorly rated companies. They got bad prospects. So they command a fairly high yield to compensate for the risk. They're tanking. Hey, it's a big deal because in the United States, about one out of six companies is what's called a zombie company, meaning they can't even make their interest payments on their debt 
from their operating cash flows. So it's a bad deal. All right, what else is going on? Uh, this is the bond index JNK. This is a full year of action right here, and it's uh, it's just tanking hard. If you can see this little black square down here, it's hitting brand new lows for this move. It's at the low, lowest it's been in over a year. Um, so when junk bonds are going, remember, I look at the outside in as a philosophy saying, Ah, you know what? We could look at the 10-year treasury. We see some amazing stuff there. But if you really want to know what's happening, you start at the outside, at the periphery, with the weakest players, with the junk debt, with the weakest countries, not the strongest countries in, in, a, in a given region or anywhere in the world. You would look at the worst stock uh, possibilities, the penny stocks rather than, and the small caps rather than the big center, you know, AAA rated companies, all, all five of them or whatever left. I don't know. All right. So that's what we're seeing there. How about this? Uh, international sovereign bond. So this is an index of the international treasury bond ETF. It's just tanking. So this is really not a good sign. We're seeing a huge decline in the price of bonds all over the globe across all different sovereign territories. So this is a very global crisis, which means it's a systemic liquidity crisis. I'm not talking US. This isn't Europe. This is now global. So there was a global agreement across all the central banks of China and Canada and Australia, New Zealand and UK and Europe and the ECB, the United States, Japan, etc. Everybody was doing this printing thing. A lot of fun. So we went through the up cycle of the liquidity boom. Now we're on the down cycle and it's hitting everybody. So pretty big deal. Kit, remember, um, <laughs> insert creaking sound. This is the Italian 10-year government bond. Just, I don't know, last week it was at 4%. The ECB is doing everything they can to prevent this rivet from popping. This is one of the outside in stories. The ECB desperately doesn't want its periphery countries that are in deep fiscal and monetary trouble out there at the edge because they, they, the, the monetary system is really working against them right now. They don't want this signaling what it's going to signal, but as try as they might, we just watch day after day the Italian 10-year bond tick up. So if you wanted to just track something to know how Europe's going, this is a place to start. You might do um, Spanish bonds, but the Italian bond is actually the place I would look first. So that's what we're seeing there. Uh, more popping rivets, looking at the yield premium comparing Italy's debt, 10-year debt, compared to Germany's debt. You, when you compare those, you find out, like, if they're both moving up together and there's no stress in, there, in that system, they're just both moving up because interest rates are going up. That's one sign. But if Italy's moving up faster than Germany, you get this chart, meaning their yields are rising faster than Germany's. This chart says stresses are rising and they're beginning to spike. And so there's huge imbalances in Europe. And if they start to break, this could very rapidly turn into a giant sovereign crisis within Europe. So again, I'm telling you that liquidity leads to insolvency. Many of these countries in Europe are already insolvent from a, on a on a fiscal basis but will this lead to some sort of an event where we have argentinian bond default or the greek bond default will we see another large bond default where we, it's basically a sovereign bankruptcy the answer is yes at this rate that's what we're going to see and at that point lots of things are going to change very very rapidly this is a huge crisis and of course hey guess what central banks are going to want to bail all that stuff out but it's going to be very unpopular now because another thread that we have going on is a deep, deep loss of faith and trust in the institutions within all these countries really tossed away due to the COVID and the horrible response and the lying and all of the gaslighting that happened there. Turns out that that's spreading throughout the system. Trust is the one thing you do not remove in a faith-based system. And that is what the central banks have toyed with and played. So just as the CDC and its equivalent in other countries destroyed our trust in health authorities, central banks have also similarly destroyed trust within the monetary authorities. So am I saying the FDA is like the CDC? Yes, I am. And it was a mistake, and I've been calling this out for a very long time because one does not lightly destroy trust in a faith-based system. But they did for nothing. They threw it away so that uh, billionaires could get more billionaire for a while. I don't, I don't know what they were after, but it was really ill-advised. All right. These are treasury inflation protected securities tips. Um, they're inflation adjusted. These yields are spiking as well a lot. Um, that's a very steep climb that we see going on right there. So just another sign that we're seeing um, very strong 
uh, movement to sell these things. Uh, and that's why the yield is popping up so much. Overall, just in, we're looking at um, uh, just asset prices generally globally, we see that global asset prices have lost about $29 trillion in a year, give or take. And so that's a pretty big deal and it's, it's heading down pretty rapidly. Now, why did all those global asset prices spike like that? Hey, because central banks printed a lot of money. Now they can't. In fact, now they're busy reducing their balance sheets, which means they're undoing that printing. And that, of course, is just immediately tanking the markets. But these things tend to get out of control very quickly because they're complex systems. And that's what I'm going to be talking about more in part two. And by the way, if you want to follow me, follow my work and make sure that you don't miss anything. I know a lot of people I consider to be colleagues and friends in this space are moving over to other platforms because of the overt and covert censorship that happens here all the time. Sometimes it's as obvious as, you know, a video gets taken down and censored. Other times it's less obvious because people get unsubscribed, they don't get served notices, uh, the algorithm just sort of detunes the episode. That happens a lot, so a lot of us are, are busy heading elsewhere. Check these all out, particularly at Sovereign Media. Um, pay, pay special attention to that. And of course, if you always want to be sure to catch what I'm talking about and take advantage of the kind of teaching that I do offer to the world, check out the membership, which is, which is right, right there. Um, we have very affordable memberships for the value that you get, and we get a lot of very happy subscribers. And by the way, just as an example of that, on May 3rd of this year, which is 2022, I had put this out for our members, and I said, hey, real estate crash is coming, and I laid out the thesis for that. It was pretty obvious. It was very obvious that that was coming, and now the world is kind of caught up to that and said, oh, yeah, this is least in the United States, and said, oh yeah, this is happening. And the reason is because of things like this. Like just two days ago, I think it was just yesterday, the 30-year mortgage rate was 6.3%. I wake up today, it's 6.8%. It's spiking, it's following that 10-year yield, going crazy. Uh, so that's very easy to say that this is going to lead to even lower house prices. And that eventually creates a big problem for somebody. The reason why to... Remember Bill Clinton, if you, maybe you don't, but once upon a time, Bill Clinton was asked on the campaign trail what he was focused on. And he said, it's the economy, stupid. Well, when it comes to housing, it's the monthly payment, stupid. Look at this. This is crazy. Danny did the math for us here. If you secured a 30-year fixed mortgage on a $600,000 home at a 2.6% interest rate in 2021, you have the same monthly mortgage payment is someone that just bought a $392,000 home today at today's 6.2% interest rate. Oops, now it's 6.8. So Danny's going to have to rerun those numbers. But um, that, I mean, that's amazing. So now all the people who were in the market for a $600,000 home, because that's what they could afford, their monthly payment says, I guess I'm shopping for a $392,000 home. As the mortgage rates crash, click up like that, we're going to see house values and prices come down. Eventually that creates the same thing we saw in 2008. But this time we don't just have a housing crisis in the U.S. to worry about. We have stocks that were in a bubble. We have bonds that were in a bubble. We have real estate that was in a bubble. All of these things were bubbling along. And so if they all crack at once, that is a massive, massive problem. And it becomes systemic very quickly. When we look at the 30-year fixed mortgage against a 30-year treasury, where they're often compared to each other, we see that the spread, the difference between what's being charged for a 30-year fixed mortgage today and a 30-year treasury is as high as it's ever been on this chart. And so that spread tells you something. Somebody writing a mortgage today is demanding a higher premium over a 30-year uh, fixed treasury because why? Because there's less trust in the system because they need to be compensated more, because there's less liquidity in the system. That whole liquidity cycle I told you about, when it hits that bad part, you see stuff like we just saw in that, that chart right there, which is watching these spreads blow out. And again, these are just the kinds of things I track that tell me that we are in some sort of a, this is a marker of the crisis. This tells me, this is like a flashing red light on a dashboard. This says, hey, um, we're in a pretty deep, deep trouble right now, and it's a probably going to get worse based on the pace and change of this move. Remember, it's not falling out of the building that hurts. It's hitting the sidewalk. It's the pace of the change. It's not the destination. It's how fast you got there or stopped all at once. That's what gets you. Um, so Wolf Richter, 
at wolfstreet.com. He does a great job with this stuff. He tracks this better than anybody I know. Look at existing home sales just tanking down here. And if we looked at um, this region right here, if you can see my cursor, that all that right there is the great housing crisis of 2008 and 9. And we saw, you know, big spike down in 2020, but then a huge rebound as liquidity was shoveled in and people started buying a lot of homes, mostly to get out of cities, I think. At least I was part of the driver. But now we're seeing this massive steep drop off again. And it's it's sudden and it's going to continue. In fact, um, we see it hasn't really showed up yet. But if you look down there, you see the, the price of those homes right there has ticked down across that that little that little peak that's gone down there. It's not a lot. It's like a 3.8% decline. But that whole huge rise from 2011 was all on the basis of cheap 1% blow or 0% money at the federal level, leading to really, really <clears throat> cheap mortgages. That was the Federal Reserve destroying trust in the system and throwing one generation under the bus, the young generations, in order to bail out the older generations so their house prices would go up, not down, which is a very bizarre thing. Are you actually more wealthy if your house goes up in price? Not if you're living in it and you have to stay living in it. The only time you can capture that is if you borrow against that extra equity you've gotten there, but now you're more in debt. So how does that help you? Or B, you sell it and you go and you downsize to a smaller house somewhere and then you can capture that equity. But who'd you capture that from? Whoever you sold it to, right? So this whole idea that you drive wealth by driving up the value of a home is, is actually a really stupid idea. But the Federal Reserve loves it. So that's what they've been doing the whole time. All right. As bad as that is in the United States, take a look at this. Remember sound is a pound, that whole pound diving off? The opposite of that is that the gilts, which is the UK version of a 10-year bond, the 10-year treasury, they call it a gilt. Look at that thing spiking there. It's just spiked up enormously. It just basically went from 2% to 4.2% in just a few weeks, really. And, and so this, unfortunately for people in the UK, bleeds over into their mortgages very, very quickly, where in the United States, we have a lot of fixed mortgages. In the UK, they have a lot of variable mortgages that are actually tied to whatever the prevailing rate of interest is. Canada has the same system. So what does that mean? It means this. Um, Guy Stallard wrote uh, that this is a nightmare for most of the middle class. Someone with a 250,000 pound mortgage currently paying 3%, under this condition, what we're seeing right here, would see their interest rate rise to 6.5% or uh, simple terms annual interest bill rise in simple terms, an annual interest bill would rise from 7,500 pounds to 16,250. They would need to find over 700 extra additional pounds per month to not lose their house. And what happened? What did they do? Nothing. They're living in the same house. It provides the same service. Nothing happened, but now they got to pay an extra 700 pounds a month or they lose it on top of spiking energy bills, electricity and gas for, for cooling and heating and stuff. It's just a full on disaster that's happening over there. And this was a policy error. These were decisions that were made by corrupt politicians, inept and corrupt central bankers, everybody running the wrong narrative. And that's kind of the theme of our time, right? 2022 is the year we found out just how naively ignorant or potentially malevolent our leadership actually was. They were self-interested. They didn't really care if they hurt anybody. They were having a grand old time conducting their policies and getting invited to, you know, big parties in Paris and London and New York and going to Davos. And it was fun, but now it's not as fun. And of course, who gets hurt most? Obviously, from the outside in, it's the middle class, it's the lower classes, it's the poor people, it's the weaker countries. These are the ones who get hurt the worst, but make no mistake, this isn't like something that just happened mysteriously. These are policy errors that I've been talking about for years. A lot of other people have too. We'll see a, a larger chorus of people talking about them now. It's pretty obvious what happened, but it took a little extra bravery for people to speak out about this early on. And those people know who they are. Congratulations to everybody who saw this and was daring to run against the party because you know what nobody likes the person who runs and flicks on the lights and says party's over but it was obvious that this party was going to end in a hangover if not worse so that's the story here today is that we are in the midst of a liquidity crisis we saw that in the dollar and bond and stock market behaviors we see that all over the place i'm going to show some of the other signs of this and how this is going to play out in part two over at my website for my members 
but liquidity crisis leads to insolvency. There are already insolvent players out there. I think we've got a good bead on at least some of who they are. Most of Europe, good energy policies, for instance. And that insolvency, if not corrected soon and quickly, leads to bankruptcy crisis. I don't think the central banks are going to be able to pivot here, not for a while because of the political climate, but there's a lot of very unhappy people out there because of having to pay all this extra money for energy, mortgage costs, this, da, 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 da. it's a very bad situation. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, part two, I'm going to give people more of an inside edge. This is vital market knowledge. If you have this insight, hey, you'll be able to see what's coming early. And that's the early warning system and service I provide for people, give you the data, give you the context so that you can see it too, because I, I want you not to get hurt. I want you to be able to see this coming, dodge the puck, you know, and make sure you don't catch that, that puck in the teeth. So if you want to, you need to become a member to see part two. And those are the membership options down there. Just click that link or um, I guess we'll put a link here or just click uh, type that in or find this link down in the description. Click on that and that'll take you to membership. Very reasonable memberships there for you. That is all I have for you here today. Thank you so much for listening. Please, 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 please do what you can to begin to protect yourself, your loved ones, your wealth. Save some of that dry powder because there will come a day when it'll be time to race out and buy more things, uh, more financial assets, but not now. Now is the time to reel it all in, take a few chips off the table, stand back, watch carefully, develop your plan for where you want to deploy, but wait, because all of the data I have right now says there are better prices on the way, and that's as kindly as I can put it at this point in time. All right, thanks very much for listening. We will see you next time. Have a great weekend and week until we see you then. Bye-bye.